Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Actino Base um, YouTube page and to our fourth Actino Base e seminar. We have two speakers again today, the first of which is Dr. Scott Yarmish, um, who is a postdoc in Uppala University in Sweden, and he's going to be talking today about his work. Um, please remember that you can leave questions for Scott in the chat on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag ActinaBase04. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Scott. Yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I'm gonna discuss a project that really started as a small um, little endeavor and turned into a much uh, wider and broader study than we ever anticipated. Um, it's a collaborative study with the group in uh, University of Santiago, Chile. And so uh, just going to discuss um, Sidaerophore production by the Streptomyces species that's isolated from the Atacama Desert. And so the first thing to kind of discuss is that uh, in the lab in Aberdeen where I did my PhD, that uh, the premise behind the chemistry that we're exploring is that extreme environments uh, hopefully cause uh, biological adaptations to occur in the organisms that survive there. And those biological adaptations yield interesting new chemistry. And so this image on the left, the Valle de la Luna is the image probably most of us think of the Atacama Desert. So this is the driest uh, place on earth and it's the Mars equivalent for earth. Um, and believe it or not, as we all probably know that there are actinobacteria that live in the soil here although they're dormant most of the time. Uh, but the Atacama Desert also looks like uh, the picture on the right, the Laguna Chaxa. Um, and so this is a very famous uh, lagoon that's present in the high altitude of the desert, um, where most people probably have seen it in a nature documentary. Um, and obviously, most importantly, is, is that there's this uh, huge reservoir of uh, biosthetic dark matter that's present in the desert. So this is the, the biological matter that we're trying to access. And so this project is really uh, the start of uh, students in Chile, uh, Diego Lagos. And so his idea is to hunt for antifungal metabolites in rhizosphere streptomyces. So he collected uh, soil from lupine plants in the San Pedro de Atacama um, at this altitude. And so he collected soil, did selective isolation, and uh, he did antifungal screening and found over 20 streptomyces strains that had antifungal activity. So he sent these to Aberdeen and we periodically and slowly went through uh, each one through small scale screening. Uh, but really we wanted to focus on this species, uh, streptomyces species S29. And so here there's an image of it growing on a plate with Botrytis cinerea. It's a fungal phytopathogen that is very costly in the wine industry. And so obviously the Chilean interest in this is very high. So using this idea, we want to try to elicit a chemical response from the streptomyces. And in this case, uh, we're gonna use co-cultivation. So this work was completed by a master student that uh, I had the pleasure of working with over the summer uh, last year. And so this idea of the two organisms growing together, um, we then tried to scale this to liquid culture, although there's problems with this, of course, between growing on solid medium and liquid medium, but we're gonna ignore that for the time being. Um, so we would grow the streptomyces uh, for a prescribed amount of days, in this case, five days. And then uh, on the fifth day, we would add a fungal liquid culture um, aseptically in this case, we tested both Aspergillus niger and uh, Botrytis cinerea. And the idea was to use a chemical approach to try to see what the response is by the streptomyces. And so uh, the reason there's 10 flasks of streptomyces is because we have did this in a 10 to one ratio in order to try to give the streptomyces the advantage of, uh, of winning the battle essentially. So the idea was to search for antifungals and as we went through and we fractionated and did biopsy guided fractionation, we found that we couldn't find any antifungals that were in isolatable amounts. So we were 
a little uh, confused, but not too much because of course it's difficult to have this translate from solid to liquid culture. Uh, but at the end of the co-culture experiment, when we streaked the plates, we saw no fungal growth. So we knew that the streptomyces had beaten out the fungus. So really what we found in the LCMS data was that we had an overproduction of siderophores. And so I'll discuss siderophores quickly. What are they? Um, they come from the Greek word sidero meaning iron and four meaning carrier. So they are literally iron carriers. They're used by the organisms to uptake iron in iron deficient environments. In bacteria, there's these four uh, main types of siderophores, but we're only gonna focus on this one type, hydroxamase siderophores. And so streptomyces and actinobacteria are professionals at making this type of uh, siderophore. And interestingly, there's four different social interactions that Air Force have. So in their environment, they can either uh, have uptake by similar cells. And so you have, in the first image on the left, you have two of the same type of bacteria producing the same siderophores and have the same uptake receptors. So they're able to use the siderophores both ways. Then you have cheating where organisms have the right type of receptor and they can essentially steal siderophores from other uh, bacteria. Uh, C is the one uh, mechanism that we believe we're seeing in our case. So in this case, we're talking about locking away. So what's happening is the streptomyces is making siderophores um, and the fungus has no receptor for uptaking these. And therefore, essentially it's locking away the nutrients and not allowing the fungus to grab a ecological niche in the environment. And so the way I like to think of this is almost like a life cycle. And so uh, the type of hydroxamine siderophore streptomyces make are known as desferoxamines. And so here we have the streptomyces and inside the cells are metabolite pools full of primary metabolites that are used for biosynthetic uh, purposes. And here we have a very uh, dumbed down version of the biosynthetic gene cluster. And so essentially what happens is these metabolite pools feed the different stages of the, of the biosynthetic genes. And so in the first stage, you can have lysine fed to DES A, but in the absence of lysine, if there's putrescine in the environment, it can bypass this biasthetic gene. And then um, DES C is really one of the most important enzymes. It's a acyl transferase, similar to coenzyme A. And so essentially it can bind any organic acid that can make a thiol ether bond with it. Um, and then like any non-ribosomal peptide, the molecules are formed in an assembly fashion. And so you produce lots of different types of desferoxamines from all these oligomers that are made. And then in the last case, the bioactivity, the molecule is transported uh, actively outside of the cell. It binds to a metal. Um, it doesn't always just bind to iron, it can bind to other metals. And then it's uptaken by specific uptake mechanisms um, shown by the Chalice Group in Warwick. Uh, and then these are put into the cell and, and potentially reduced. So now that we have all this information um, with the life cycle, essentially how do we locate these desferoxamines? So you use a technique called molecular networking. This is done through the GNPS platform from UC San Diego. Essentially the idea is that when you run mass spec data and you uh, obtain MS-MS spectra or fragmentation spectra, you um, run it through this workflow and essentially two things are done. Your data is compared to the library that's housed in GNPS. And then also your spectra within your data are compared to each other and seen how similar they are. And from this information, uh, what's known as a molecular network is made or a molecular family. So right here is a very small molecular family. Uh, and in this case, they're using surfactant as the example molecule. And what's happening is that uh, each circle is what's known as a node. And these are different ions that are linked together uh, based on fragmentation similarity. And of course, uh, not only do they, they don't have to be exactly matched. So for instance, the other molecules linked with surfactant C14 are other surfactants that just have an extension. And of course their fragmentation is slightly different but GNPS is able to offset this and, and, and look for this. So what's the data look like? So, this is the molecular network for Streptomyces species S29 uh, with co-culture extracts, monoculture extract, as you can see from the legend, and also some HPLC fractions. We tried to isolate individual molecules. 
And so the main takeaway here is that each circle that you observe that has a label, so F1, F2, F4, F3, um, they're all desferoxamine-containing molecular families. And so off the bat, we see uh, a lot more production than we normally do with other streptomyces uh, species that we tested. So this was an interesting result um, that we saw and we said, okay, let's start going in. So the benefit of desferoxamines that we can solve their structures uh, based on mass spec alone. So not to get too deep into the weeds of things, but uh, peptides fragment in standard ways in the mass spectrometer. So we can use this standard fragmentation in order to uh, elucidate structures. So the idea here is you start with a molecular family and we take a single node. So in this case, we're taking mass 673. And using accurate mass, we can predict a molecular formula. And uh, we know what molecular formula should look like for desferoxamines. So we can use this as a, as a measure. We get lots of structural information about it, like how many double bonds are in the molecule. And then looking at the fragmentation, we can start piecing together parts of the molecule. So here, um, part C, we can see um, the standard desferoxamine structure that we can build. And then essentially what's left is what could be placed on one of the termini. And so in this case, we're filling it out with one of these organic acids. And once we propose a structure, we go in and we predict the, the fragmentation. And then we try to compare it back to the uh, observed fragmentation. And if these things match, and of course we have accurate mass fragments. So this is fantastic for actually proving that these are the fragments we can, um, we can confirm that that's most likely the structure. So um, when we dive into the molecular families, what we have here, so this is molecular family one, and each uh, hexagon or annotated um, spectrum with a structure is a known desferoxamine. And so we see that multiple of them are in the molecular family and the hexagons are representative of ones in the GNPS library. But everyone that has a star is a new derivative. And so we can see we have quite a number of them. And then we have some kind of off on the outsides of the molecular family that don't have stars, don't have structures because we can't solve them with mass spec alone. They're kind of weird structures that we can't determine what the acid could be that's added to the terminus. We also see uh, metal complex uh, ions of these uh, feroxamines. And so we have an uh, iron complex, and also an aluminum complex. And so these are all spread out through this molecular family. And we have one new derivative that we are able to determine. All the remaining have been assigned already from uh, the other analysis of the molecular families. And so essentially this whole molecular family is assigned with metal complex uh, feroxamines. So this is just a good confirmation that we're seeing the right thing. We're predicting the structures correctly. Um, and so, what type of structures do we see? So we have what we are calling aryl desferoxamines. They have these uh, phenylacetic acid moieties at the C-terminus. So for instance, this is a representative one that contains putrescine on the N-terminus instead of cadaverine. So kind of an interesting little change. Um, we also see, this is the second example that we can see uh, in the literature of a glycosylated um, desferoxamine. And of course, uh, we're proposing its place on the molecule, but it can happen on any of the N-hydroxies that are present in it. And we also see acyl desferoxamines. These uh, have been found to be possible before, um, but none before with this uh, N-acetyl cadaverine moiety that's highlighted in orange. Um, so we have a large amount of these derivatives, and then also these monounsaturated uh, derivatives. And so we see all these. The real question is, does co-cultivation elicit activity, uh, a response? And so in monoculture, we observe 15 new analogs and nine known analogs of desferoxamines. And then in co-culture, we observe nine additional new analogs and 15 additional known analogs. And so we're pretty sure that we're it's clear that we're seeing a, a response from the streptomyces grown with the fungus, but also it's apparent that our streptomyces is just very prolific in making these molecules. Interestingly, a majority of the ones made in co-culture are these 
acyl desferoxamines described by Traxler. And essentially they showed that these are only produced in um, co-culture with other actinobacteria or in their study. And so potentially these um, are, are unique to uh, co-culture environments. And so this may be something to explore. Well, so Diego went in uh, and looked at the uh, homology. So using NCBI, um, a distance tree, he generated it. So at the bottom is our query. I'll, I'll zoom in here. And we can see that the acyl transferase for our desferoxamine gene cluster is branched uh, off from everything else. And so maybe we have tapped into something uh, a little more unique than just the normal acyl transferase that's in the desferoxamine pathway. So we, uh, he also generated um, knock-ins of this acyl transferase into Streptomyces silicolor. And so we, we just have to run uh, these experiments to see if we essentially get production of more of these uh, uh, desferoxamine analogs that we observe in our strain that potentially might not be observed in uh, Streptomyces silicolor. So really now the question is, is this the limit of the chemical space of what, what we've seen? And so to explore this, use a tool called MS2LDA. And so essentially what this is talking about is fragmentation patterns are essentially fingerprints. And so using the idea that fragment patterns are fingerprints, we can assign these fingerprints to certain types of molecular structures. So the example they use in their paper is here's ferulic acid and ethyl phenyl. And in a molecule that contains both of these, we see these fragment patterns. And so the idea is that uh, we can take these fingerprints and potentially start building structures. So how this works, how's this, how does this work with desferoxamines? So here we have two desferoxamines. The only difference is the extension of a CH2. And we have their uh, fragmentation patterns on the right. And so when the molecules fragment, they fragment, uh, they have similar fragments with each other. And so we can go through it and we can see these fragments in the MS2 spectrum. But MS2LDA also looks at losses. And so even though on the right-hand side, these fragments don't match up, the loss of 160 is the same for both. And so this is what's known as a mass two motif. So I can go in and curate this and say, this motif means this potentially this type of structure. So how does this look with the data? So using MS2LDA and GNPS and Cytoscape, I merged the two networks together. And essentially this network is an image showing uh, with every single um, desferoxamine that I was able to uh, identify and elucidate in the previous molecular network has now been highlighted. So 55 nodes or different, different molecules um, are highlighted and 573 edges, meaning connections between these nodes. Um, and of course there could be multiple of these connections in, uh, to two different nodes because they might have different motifs. But so this is what the previous data was showing. And when you run the MS2 LDA, now we have almost triple the amount of nodes that are picked out that have these desferoxamine motifs and double the amount of edges. And interestingly, obviously the big molecular family highlights more. We also see a lot more of what are known as singletons or ones that are nodes that connect to each other down at the bottom there. So they're single ions that essentially have these motifs. So clearly there's a lot more chemical space that's present uh, that we need to explore. The question is, uh, how do we go about it? And uh, what's the right way to do this? Um, because these molecules tend not to be produced in very large quantities because they're very effective. And so just to summarize, so Streptomyces uh, species S29 is this prolific uh, desferoxamine producer. So using the idea that it uh, maybe was, it produced antifungals, which we can't say it doesn't, we just didn't uh, get it to produce it in liquid culture. We tried to explore this uh, potential for antifungals. We didn't see that, but we still didn't see the fungus persist in the co-culture. So using molecular networking, we found uh, a number of new analogs of desferoxamines. And then using uh, the MS2 LDA protocol, we see that the chemical space that this streptomyces, but probably other ones as well, the chemical space of desferoxamines is much broader, much wider than previously anticipated. So there's a lot more exploration here to be done in terms of chemistry. And really the exciting thing 
is what's the application? So the idea is that Dystryptomyces could be used as a soil additive and that instead of producing a single bullet that kills a fungus or kills a pathogen, it's actually almost creating kind of what I'm calling a desferoxamine shield. And so essentially it's protecting the plant from any of these pathogens by removing all the nutrients from other pathogens to try to grab an ecological niche. So lastly, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, so uh, the team in Aberdeen, so MT was the master students and my advisors and the entire Marine Bi Biodiscovery Center, but also our collaborators in Chile, Diego Lagos, the PhD student and his advisors. Um, and lastly, thank Actinobase for putting on the seminar series. Happy to take any questions now. Well, thank you very much for that talk, Scott. Um, we actually have a load of questions. So okay. I'll start off with, what is the origin of putrescine in the environment? Uh, so, I'm, I actually am not entirely sure. Um, it could be, so cadaverine is, is a product on the way from lysine um, and essentially putrescine uh, could be a breakdown product from something else, but I'm not entirely sure. Something I should look into. But there are known cases from other actinobacteria of uh, putrescine containing siderophores. And so it's, it's clearly a, a, a normal process um, that's happening, but yeah. Um, Jessica Gomez asks, how did you know the molecular formula that you had a uh, deroxyphen, sorry, I'm gonna butcher the word. No, no, it's desferoxamine, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you said that it was a charistic molecular formula. What is that? Yeah, so because um, the desferoxamines are made um, essentially in this uh, assembly fashion with oligomers, you always have um, this uh, anhydroxy cadaverine moiety in there. And you know that it always contains two nitrogens essentially. And so um, although there could be desferoxamines that contain a nitrogen attached on the terminus, the C terminus through the acyl transferase, um, typically, we always see an even number of nitrogens, um, and then the number of oxygens can vary. Um, and can this method be performed for other chemical elicitors as well? Yeah, so um, it doesn't have to just be used for peptides, of course. Um, it's useful because we know the fragmentation uh, pathways of peptides, but uh, any small molecule can have... Um, MS2LDA or GNPS run on it. And the idea is that you are removing um, the potential for human error in terms of linking up data that you would never even link in, a, in raw data before. But um, now the fragmentation patterns, if they match up, um, you can use it for anything. So I've used it also for polyketides um, and other small molecules. Um, another one is, does Streptomyces S29 undergo the explorer phenotype? Consequently, were there any notable mm -hmm. in present volatile compounds? Yeah, so I'm not sure if it undergoes the explorer um, phenotype uh, because we didn't do our experiments uh, in Aberdeen on solid medium. You, of course, can observe this, um, but it might be uh, something I can ask uh, our collaborator and um, something to track down and see if it does it on solid medium. Um, Marcel Jaspers asks, do you know the position of the double bond in the monosaturated fatty acid? No, so, uh, so the proposal is in the position that I showed um, because of the potential precursor that it's coming from. I, it, the name escapes me, um, but it's a known um, binding partner to coenzyme A. Um, but of course, it can be located at any position in the in the um, in the out acyl chain, and so we can propose it's in that position, but it could be anywhere. I think just one more, um, and then we'll move on. Uh, how common are aluminum chelating oxamines from Streptomyces? So I couldn't find very much literature on this. Um, because aluminum is not used by the cell in any way, it's actually toxic. Um, it's interesting, it, it's uh, an interesting fact that it binds it and potentially streptomyces uses it in some way. I have no cl clue if it does, but essentially the problem is that the binding affinity for iron and aluminum is pretty similar. And so 
it's an unfortunate consequence of streptomyces uh, releasing these desferoxamines, binding iron, but at the same time, it can also bind aluminum. So somehow it's uh, recycling or unbinding the aluminum before it enters the cell so it's not toxic. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Um, there are a lot of more questions. I'm, I'm sure you'll be happy to answer anyone on, on Twitter yeah. or um, if, they, if they want to continue talking about your work. Um, we're going to have our second speaker, um, Dr. Magdalena Karwaska from uh, Hertzwitz Institute of Immunology in Poland. Um, Hello. <laughs> so if you'd like to start screen sharing when you're ready. Uh, yes, I'm trying to. Um, oh my God, again, my browser is preventing access. It worked already, so I don't know what happened. Screen sharing, never, your browser is preventing access. Are you sure you uh, are allowing me to do it yes. on your side? There should be a button at the bottom of Zoom that says share screen. Mm -hmm. Włącz tutaj któryś pokaż slajdów na dole, na dole, belki niżej. Okay. Okay. Did it all fine on the when we tested? Your browser. What's going with my browser? Preventing. Okay, to it. Uh, it tells me your <coughs> your browser is preventing access to your screen, uh, share screen, but it worked. Zablokowano tymczasowo. Ah, what? Czekaj, 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 bo ja zablokowałam przecież. I co teraz? Oh my God. You asked me to stop sharing and I stopped sharing and I don't know how to unstop it now. Share screen. Mm. Keep closing your browser, help, and then trying to share the screen again once the browser is closed. Może się, może się po prostu wylogujemy z tego jeszcze raz. Spróbuj jeszcze raz. I think I have to join uh, the meeting again, maybe. Uh, Nie ruszaj, to jest mysz. Ale bo tu, tu jest gdzieś to opuszczanie tego terenu, tak? Leave meeting. Jeszcze raz się załaguję do tego meetingu. Hmm? I guess this gives everyone time to go get a coffee or a drink while we sort this out. Hopefully we should have it sorted fairly soon. Start video. Start video. Dostępni. Teraz share screen. Wybór no, okna. Okna. No. E, pokaz slajdów. Udostępni. Ok. Can you see my slide now? All right. Great. So if you'd like to take it away. Okay. So hello everybody. I'm sorry for the problems. Um, and I'm glad that I can share uh, some of uh, my results. Uh, with you today. Uh, we investigated the life of Streptomyces silicone color A32. Okay, so I start again. 
Uh, hello, everybody. I'm sorry for the uh, technical problems. My name is Magdalena Kotowska, and I'm glad to uh, share some of my results with you today. Uh, we investigate the life of Streptomyces silicolor A32, the most famous model organism for the genus Streptomyces. As you know, these bacteria inhabit mainly, mainly soil, but also other interesting ecological niches. Uh, they can be symbionts of plants and animals. In one of the previous uh, actinobase seminars, we heard about those which live in symbiosis with ants. Today, we heard about those uh, who live in uh, very extreme uh, desert conditions. Uh, streptomyces produced a vast number of important secondary metabolites and uh, hydrolytic enzymes, which give them access to complex organic food sources available in soil and uh, thus to participate in biogeochemical cycles. Uh, our work is focused on the regulation of silymycin biosynthetic gene cluster. On this occasion, I'd like to invite you to have a look at our review paper published last year. And today I will talk um, about the protein SCO 6294, which we later called HYPE-R. Originally, we thought that it might be one of the regulators of the um, polyketate synthase CPK gene cluster, but it turned out not to be the case. Uh, sequence uh, analysis of uh, this protein shows that it belongs to GNTR-like uh, family uh, proteins. Um, it has a conservative N-terminal uh, DNA binding uh, domain and a C-terminal uh, domain. Uh, the analysis of um, hype R protein shows that it belongs to the FAD R subfamily and has a FCD domain, which stands for FAD R like C terminal uh, domain. The um, theoretical uh, three dimensional model, which was obtained by uh, FIRE 2 program, was based on a similar protein from Thermotoga maritima, which was crystallized. And so you can see the two uh, domains here, a close look uh, and comparison with uh, FADR allows us to find some amino acids, uh, which may be involved in um, DNA binding. It shows a nice uh, fit. And uh, the C-terminal uh, domain shows a characteristic histidine um, residues, three histidines that are sticking into the internal uh, cavity of the um, domain and uh, are able to complex a uh, metal ion. In uh, the case of Thermotoga maritima structure, it was a nickel uh, ion within the crystal structure. Um, in case of another um, fat are like uh, regulator, seed O. Um, the metal uh, binding was shown to be crucial for uh, binding of a um, small molecular organic ligand, which was uh, citrate uh, in the case of site O. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, our protein hype R uh, also interacted with metal ions. Uh, DNA uh, binding uh, was prevented by some metal uh, ions and um, the experiment uh, where we, me we measured intrinsic uh, tryptophan uh, fluorescence uh, in the presence of uh, different metal chlorides showed that the response uh, only in case of titration with uh, zinc chloride and the binding constants that were calculated are reasonably similar to uh, the results of uh, to the constants of uh, Thermotoga uh, maritima uh, protein. Uh, we have determined the binding site of hype R protein within its own uh, promoter region by DNA's one footprinting, and the region protected uh, from digestion contained. Um, a sequence uh, which corresponded to, to a motif uh, found by a bacterial wide one hybrid system. Uh, this sequence, which is uh, marked with a box, 
was used to search uh, the chromosome of uh, Streptomyces civicolor for other potential uh, binding sites, sites of uh, height R, mm, allowing for uh, first of all one mismatch and then the two binding, uh, the two sequences that were bound were uh, taken for another round of search. Uh, so finally, uh, we found um, these um, potential um, binding sites, and six of them were determined, uh, were shown to be bound uh, by hype R protein uh, in the EMSA uh, assay. Uh, these fragments that were bound uh, in EMSA were then tested for promoter activity using the luciferase reporter system developed in Justin Nodwell's lab. Um, uh, we obtained a modified version of the reporter plasmid uh, with hygromycin resistance cassette from uh, Dagmar Jakimovic. Uh, the tested fragments uh, were cloned into the reporter plasmid and then introduced into the wild type and hype R deletion strains. Uh, the plasmid carries the full luciferase operon, uh, so you don't need to add any um, extra substrates for luciferase. They grow, and if the promoter is active, um, the light is emitted. Uh, so we were able to culture the test strains on solid medium in the 96 well plate directly um, in the plate, directly uh, incubated them directly in the light reader, and uh, measure the luminescence uh, every hour. And this graph shows um, the summary of the uh, luminescence measurements uh, results. Uh, four uh, of the tested promoters uh, were shown to be uh, activated uh, by the deletion of uh, hype R gene. Uh, these are the ones that are uh, underlined uh, with the red line. Uh, one of them uh, was shown, um, the activity of one of them was slightly re reduced in the deletion strain. This is the gene uh, adjacent and divergent from uh, hype R, uh, coding a um, IBC transporter. Uh, but uh, we consider that this uh, effect is uh, indirect one uh, because um, the binding site is uh, close to the uh, hype R um, gene and not the, and uh, it would be in our opinion too far to influence the, uh, the other gene and no other binding site was determined in this uh, intergenic region. Uh, when comparing the amino acid sequence of hype R with other GNTR like proteins we found that it has an unusually long N-terminus, and um, so we suspected that it might be uh, a mistake in the annotation. We used the luciferase assay, and we found that the fragment was marked here in orange, and uh, in strep DB is annotated uh, as the coding sequence with the start side here. Uh, is in fact um, active as a promoter in the luciferase system, as opposed uh, to the um, black uh, part, uh, which, which we call here the old uh, promoter region between the primaries six, uh, P6 and P5. This one was not active. So um, uh, we postulate that this site here is really the um, true uh, start codon from uh, of uh, type R uh, gene. And in the meantime, the um, transcriptional starting site was uh, published, uh, which is here. So it fits. Uh, so now the important question, uh, what uh, do the proteins do that are targeted by hype R uh, repressor? And uh, one of the uh, binding sites uh, lies uh, upstream of a, a five gene, uh, five gene uh, operon. In order to answer the question, 
uh, we analyzed their predicted amino acid sequences uh, with the following tools here. And uh, it was not a trivial task, but finally we came up with a hypothesis that uh, this uh, fibrin operon may be involved in L-hydroxyproline um, metabolize metabolism. We found that streptomyces silicone uh, can grow on L-hydroxyproline as the sole source of carbon, although it's not very happy with it. And uh, we found that disruption of uh, one of the genes uh, here uh, resulted in the loss of this uh, ability to grow on uh, hydroxyproline as a sole source of carbon. Uh, hydroxyproline is one of the main components of uh, collagen and it is also found in the plant cell walls and it, in uh, root nodules. And uh, one of the remaining target genes of hyper um, protein, SCO5912, uh, codes for reputative collagenase. So it makes sense that it could uh, degrade collagen and provide uh, L-hydroxyproline as one of the products of uh, collagen degradation. Mm, and the other uh, gene that was uh, that is a target of hype R is um, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase or decarboxylase. Uh, so it fits to the other um, end of the pathway and it would um, take part in directing the alpha glutarate is the product to uh, the main uh, central metabolism TCA uh, cycle. The enzyme required to convert alpha to glutar glutaric semialdehyde to alpha to glutarate uh, was not identified uh, by us, uh, was not among the hype R um, targets, but uh, we found a candidate gene to fulfill this task, which is SCO1871. Um, uh, L-hydroxyproline uh, utilization, uh, utilization is not very common, it's not very widespread material. Uh, the reports uh, are mainly from pseudomonads, uh, for example, pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a pathogen, and also from uh, some soil organisms, um, such as uh, plant endosymbiont fixing nitrogen, Cynorhizobium meliloti, and several other organisms. Uh, the examples uh, here are, are uh, well studied, and the regulation uh, of this um, pathway is known uh, in these organisms. In the case of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, the pathway is activated by uh, an RRC family um, activator, which binds uh, L-hydroxyproline. Uh, in case of Cynorhizobium meliloti, uh, the pathway is repressed by hype R uh, protein, which belongs to FADR uh, subfamily which probably uh, binds dehydroxyproline or a downstream uh, metabolite. And that's uh, why uh, we chose the same name uh, for SCO6294 protein. And uh, you can note that um, this uh, hype, uh, oh, okay, never mind. Uh, with that, we come to the final uh, question. What would be the effector molecule uh, bound by uh, hype R regulator? The first choice was L-hydroxyproline or dehydroxyproline. Uh, we made the uh, reporter assay, the luciferase assay, and we found that uh, indeed L-hydroxyproline stimulated uh, promoter activity. Uh, but in the EMSA assay, 
we didn't uh, we couldn't see any uh, difference uh, adding uh, either a hydroxy or dehydroxyproline and uh, it did, uh, also the addition uh, or the lack of zinc didn't change uh, anything uh, here so this uh, question remains uh, open and so to sum up we identified genes controlled by type R and the consensus binding sequence. Uh, we identified its role as a repressor and autorepressor. We have shown that uh, it binds uh, zinc ion, although the organic uh, ligand is still un un unknown. Uh, we annotated the genes from its regulon and uh, uh, we showed that uh, the promoter activity is, uh, of the target genes is stimulated by L-hydroxyproline. And to our knowledge, this is the first indication of L-hydroxyproline utilization pathway in streptomyces. I would like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who participate in the research and the uh, funding sources. And thank you. Uh, very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that talk, Magdalena. Um, if you'd be right, we're taking some questions now. Um, the first of which is, how did you find out um, that HYPR belonged to the GN GNTR family? How did you find out that HYPR belongs to the GNTR family? Uh, this was uh, done by the sequence, uh, amino acid sequence uh, analysis, the BRAST comparisons, and also the um, uh, the model, uh, the theoretical model uh, suggested that very strongly. Thank you. Um, and is there a role for metals in collagen metabolism? Mm. Can you repeat? Uh, is there? Um, yes, I is know that. Uh, that uh, okay, I, I I see the <laughs> I see the question now. Um, I don't uh, know exactly the um, the enzymology of uh, collagen uh, degradation, but I know that the uh, um, collagenase is a metal uh, met metalloprotease uh, as as the class of enzymes. And um, it's annotated as a, or is similar to zinc containing metalloproteases. So um, that's the role uh, of, uh, there would be the role of, of uh, the metal as a cofactor of, uh, of the collagenase, which is a protease. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, just... Thank you very much, Magdalena. And, um, I'm Thank you. on Twitter if anyone would like to um, ask you any further questions. Um, that's sort of it uh, for our speakers for today. Thank you very much um, for those really interesting talks. Um, we are going to be back next Thursday at 3 p.m. Um, BST, and we will have two speakers, um, myself and um, myself and um, Yao Jun Tong from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, so uh, please subscribe to this channel to receive any updates and please follow us um, uh, on Twitter at Actinabase. And uh, we hope to see you next week.